Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Paul Cryer, who's from the African Conservation Trust, and he's going to be telling us about moving to, com to sustainable community conservation. Thanks, Greg. <coughs> um, um, okay, at the moment I'm uh, working on something called the Kuzi River Conservation Project. <coughs> it's uh, looking at um, protected area expansion, community conservation on the Mkuzi River, as uh, Zulian Rhino Reserve, some kind of game reserve. Like so many other um, uh, protected areas, the boundary is a river, like um, um, Kuzi, it's the Kuzi game to itself, uh, Tala. And um, uh, yeah, and, and that's a problem. So that was sort of the focus of the, of, uh, um, of the project. I don't want to focus too much on the biological components of it. As the title suggests, it's looking at the manner in which we have been working with communities, and that's really what I want to focus on today. But the area is spectacularly beautiful. It's, it is inhabited, uh, but relatively low density. There's beautiful areas, and then the north of the river where some kind of game reserve is obviously uh, a spectacular place. I, I want to start off by telling you a story about this tree, which is not an indigenous tree. It's a New Zealand tree, uh, things called the cowrie pine, um, and uh, it grows very straight and tall. So it was harvested for uh, for ships' masts, and uh, <coughs> some innovative farmers in in South Africa in the late 1800s planted some of these as uh, as an investment. And this this remnants of them can be found around Richards Bay, Durban. Um, but the, the, there's two things that are significant about this little story. The one is that the, the farmers that planted those things in the, in, uh, the 1890s, that they, they did something that they were not going to reap the benefits of. They were never going to see, they were never going to see those things harvested. They take uh, 100, 120 years to mature. So, you know, and that side of it is very, very positive. But there's something which is far more worrying about that. And that is that those people who planted those trees could not envisage a world in 1990 or 2000 or 2010 that was not dependent on ships' masts. The future that they were imagining was never going to happen. Now, the world is changing at a much faster pace now. We're dealing with incredible uncertainty. The one thing that we can be certain of is that when we imagine the world in 30 years' time or 40 years' time, we're almost certainly getting it wrong. We're dealing with unparalleled economic insecurity, uh, social pressures, and environmentally, we all know where that is. It means that that's the, that's the, that's the basis on which we now work when we start working at community conservation or protected area expansion. And that's really worrying. It means that we've got to design something for a very uncertain future. Um, so, it really, probably a better title for this talk would have been Rethinking Community-Based Conservation. That's actually the title of a paper by a chap called Furcott Burks. Uh, unfortunate name. But, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't think of Inspector Clouseau. Um, um, but really, I mean, what sort of the basis of, of his uh, of this paper was? You know, we we are <coughs> we are dealing with incredible uncertainty. We've got to deal with complexity. We've got to manage for complexity. And um, yeah, so. I'd like to use that as sort of a backdrop from where we go on here. Uh, <clears throat> you know, just come, you know, highlighting that many of the many of the uh, jewels of our province, probably this has broad applicability for outside 
protected areas. Uh, and, I mean, even many of the problems that we identify inside protected areas have their origin outside of them. You know, so that's the sort of necessity for this, and of, of expanding and creating these linkages between our protected areas. This is a real uh, rough uh, motivation for why we do what we do. The background for this probably comes from the Convention on Biological Diversity, particularly Article 8, where signatory states have to set aside land for uh, conservation and um, set up protected area networks. They do that on particular sort of criteria, and then that's sort of translated into strategies on various scales, uh, and then that it's itself then translates into protected area expansion plans. In an ideal world, we would, we would see, you know, have the protected area expansion plans dovetailing perfectly with stewardship programs, and, um, and that, would be, that would be great. In, in reality, there's a, there are big gaps between those two, and it's identifying those. And really, the work that we've been doing is looking at what needs to happen between you know, identifying areas that we need to expand into and, and engaging with, with Greg and his team. Certainly, those problems would, uh, would relate to the complexity of the issue and mealing, you know, dealing with uh, you know, huge amounts of stakeholders and, and, and a, a really uneven playing field. Uh, and, and then also that many of the particular issues, even when we identify them, they, they require some kind of champion to move ahead with it. Certainly, you know, um, I think Bill would have experienced that and we're talking about things at a Tala. So, so well, I point this at the screen. I shouldn't do that, should I? <laughs> <laughs> really... <laughs> Really what we're trying to do is to, we're trying to look at a, a methodology that's going to meet those needs. And uh, there are sort of four components to that, and I just want to hi highlight that in, in looking at this methodology, it's anything but complete. We have robbed ideas from absolutely everywhere. The Mgana project was a, a major uh, inspiration. There were some other very interesting case studies in India around the Panatiga Reserve. Uh, some fascinating ones about communities dealing, uh, the relationship between communities and land in uh, South America. And this is not just an ACT project. This is very much a, a, a team thing. KZN Wildlife, and, uh, so many aspects of KZN Wildlife, the social ecology unit, uh, some of them are here today, uh, other parts of scientific services, management, community conservation, district conservation offices, um, Wildlands Conservation Trust, a ridiculous amount of coffee, um, and in basically every time we, we sort of have a discussion about this, new ideas get pulled into it. We're going to be rushing through this methodology so quickly, but the, I mean, my primary purpose of being here today is, is if any of you have any ideas or things, please contact me and we can sort of, you know, this is real work in progress. What I want us to do is to imagine a hypothetical community area, um, which would have... Um, you know, areas where people are living, areas, you know, agricultural uses, and then also some fairly uh, low-density, uh, uh, sparse areas, inverted commas. When we, you know, one of the things we do with that is we start to put a land-use plan for that, and quite commonly, you know, we identify the development nodes, agricultural areas, high and low density, and um, <coughs> commonly, in making a community conservation area, we would, you know, identify it. Um, and uh, and you know start applying those sort of uh, particular principles to it. When we look at the at the the funding for this kind of thing, we rely heavily on formal governance structures for the uh, development nodes, f funding from various opportunities for the agricultural thing. There's a there would certainly be the idea that this would be subsistence and you know hopefully a commercial aspect to it. But the the um, the community conservation area, you know. And please, today I'm making sweeping generalizations in order to get this through in 20 minutes. But, um, you know, that we tend to, you know, look at it as an isolated entity to, you know, the purpose of it is to be some kind of economic engine for the community. Uh, it's acknowledged that there's going to be some fairly specialized skills required in that, and those get brought in from the outside. And, you know, it is to be a little, yeah, income generator. What is a common... A, a common outcome across three continents, a, and some would say it's just a matter of time. 
is that we end up with unseen pressures, social, agricultural, um, what that, what that, the effect that that has on the conservation area, you know, the, the benefits in the conservation area are con considered by the community to be more internal, money is, may be generated, but it's, they're spending it more and more on the, on the conservation area, less is getting into the community, hostility starts to develop, uh, boundaries are, are blurred, uh, less money is made, and uh, we end up with a little bit of a, a mess. So when we started working with communities in, in uh, one of our project areas, you know, and uh, one of the questions that they had to us was, well, you know, what's, you, you know, do you have a plan? And, and we would have to say, well, not one that works. Um, <laughs> and really what we then did was to say, well, you know, the, our starting point was to, to find out you know, what is the, how, how does the community live? How does, what are its aspirations? What do you, what, what do, what do you want in your lives? Forget the land. Just what you know. What what are their aspirations? Um, and 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 then slowly start to understand what those local needs were. Um, and the idea of saying, well, in actual fact, the first part of our plan is just to come here and 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 listen. And then when we've done a bit of listening, then we can say, well, let's you know, the, we and I say we is. You know, um, KZ and Wildlife, um, Social Ecology and myself, we didn't have the resources, but we might be able to bring resources in. And what we started doing was setting up this communication network between outside expertise and the community. And this was the, the, this is the first um, component of our methodology, is to, is to set up that communication, um, communication network. And it, the purpose of it is to link, is to link uh, uh, external resources, internal resources, resources. The crucial component of this is, is making the community members that they, they were, they held collateral. You know, quite quite often the the idea was, you know, external experts come in and there's a, a very top down kind of um, approach. And and what was necessary here is that those people had they they were they were holding the essential. Um, yeah, the, the the most valuable entity of it. And, in actual fact, that they held a lot of personal expertise about how that area was. I don't know how to make that slide go back, but if you look at that land in the background, it's beautiful. Um, so, so um, and then what that communication eventually worked for was saying, well, you know, what does that community want? It's funny that it emerged, was, yeah, commonly, uh, was this desire for sustainable communities. There was a lot of discussion about what sustainable means that community, what, what was their interpretation of it. It's, it's funny, uh, in uh, Kurvis' talk where he talked about some of the priorities, all spoke about the delivery of ecosystem services. Many of the things that this translated into was when they looked at a land use plan, a land use plan at the end of the day had areas which wanted to be set aside for, as a, with a conservation based land use. Um, I want to jump a little bit here and have a quick look at our protected area categories. Uh, I've sort of color coded them with similar things. That's, those are the South African ones. These are the IUCN categories. Um, if we look at uh, our sort of our view of, um, you know, the, our conventional view of community conservation areas, it's where, you know, we, we have a man. We, we're basically setting up little miniature Kruger parks in our head. That's our that's our desire. You know, the management plan, the proclamation process, the 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 purpose of it is oriented towards uh, biodiversity and ecosystem, uh, and ecosystem conservation. There's a component of income generation into it. There's trained staff. And then we've got this fence, which of, of course is to keep animals in, but there is that, there's always that edge to it that it's a, it's a barrier. And, and uh, you know, with that scale, with that model, we're making use very much of the nature reserve category in our, in our system and uh, the national park system in terms of the IUCN. We've got to remember that that didn't work too well. So the second, the, the, the question that we ask is what would happen if we expanded our focus beyond the conservation area and we looked at the entire community as one socio-economic environmental entity? 
Well, then what we would be doing, we would be making use particularly of um, other areas in the IUCN category, and we would be manifesting them through different components, not relinquishing the value of the nature reserve category, but certainly perhaps making use of the protected environment category inside a stewardship process. Still pointed at the screen. <laughs> the purpose for that is certainly management ease and finance. But the approach to that means that we're going to be, we're going to have to integrate these components completely. It means that we can't have protected area managers separate to agricultural experts and sociologists. We've got to find protected area manage managers who, who are sensitized to this process. We've got to have agricultural experts that are not going to be uh, pursuing practices that are in direct contravention of these principles. Talking of which, we've, I mean, there are dipping tanks on the floodplains of the Nkusi. That's just so. We're talking about uh, that that um, uh, you know viewing the entire area, and this is something that we started to get from Mgano, I feel, with viewing the entire area as a single unit. The difficulty with that is that quite often those sort of are, are conflicting forces in society, and uh, you know the attempt. <coughs> um, is to try and harness those and, and move them in the same direction. Well, and you know, that's been a strong emphasis of um, the African Parks Network. Some of their case studies talk about that's the movement that they've got to do. Of course, that, that relies on the fact that they're not going to be able to disappear. As soon as, as soon as the input, the channeling input disappears, those ships can go in their own way. When we start to say, well, how are we going to integrate it into a community? We say, well, if we were to... If we were to if we were to take some crew off that ship, and some crew off that ship, and some crew off that ship, and stick them on one boat that was going to be there for a short period of time, remembering that the goal is defined by the network, the, the communication network. This is the implementing team, and it has a temporary catalytic function. So, so the outcome, the idea is not to change the outcome, the idea is that the catalytic team containing those that's various elements of expertise would simply you know, lower the amount of energy or resources required to get that particular outcome. And um, that's the third component of, um, of our methodology, is, is the creation and, and use of a catalytic team for a finite period of time. I want to have a, 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 just pause for a quick minute on the, the social component. We weren't, you know, this, this, was, this was not easy work. The community there, they were disillusioned with poor uh, service delivery. Uh, there's a lot of corruption. Um, there's distrust of outsiders. And um, as someone said in the, one of this morning's talk, there are residual social issues which still plague now. In those, in those uh, community meetings, the community was uh, suspicious of me because I was a white guy. They were suspicious of Pindi because she wasn't a white guy. <laughs> They're suspicious of Joe because he has a car that makes him look like a rap star. Uh, but, um, so, so uh, you know, and the thing about it was that it, it made it, it made you so it made you sort of wonder how you know how society was functioning at all, at all. Uh, and, and, and some would say that it wasn't because people were leaving. Certainly, the survey that the Social Ecology Unit did indicated a very slanted age distribution which showed that young people were leaving. But, but beyond that, what we saw was the, the informal governance structures. There were mechanisms there, not organized by the municipality or the tribal structure, that made sure that kids were fed in schools. You know, when the water system went down, there are systems inside society to ensure that where people collect river water is not the same place where cattle drink. There are mechanisms which are self-regulating in that. And, and what, uh, what we were decided was an essential component of this was, the, um, was that we were, going, we were going to acknowledge and include in the project the use of these informal governance structures. Uh, and uh, and, and in, it, that was going to be an essential component about ensuring sustainability, where service delivery of the former ones was sort of falling down. So in summary, you know, our methodology at this stage consists of these four components. It's about setting up a communication network, 
uh, it's about um, viewing the entire uh, community, including the areas of land, that's the land in the background, they're beautiful land, psych ads by the way, uh, as, um, as, a, as a whole socio-economic uh, environmental entity, implementing it through the use of a catalytic team, and then the other thing is using informal governance structures. And I think that's my time, so thank you. really interesting. Um, I know we're going a little bit over time, but uh, because this is really relevant to a lot of stewardship issues, I think maybe we will take one or two questions. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you for the presentation. I appreciate the fact that you recognised from the very beginning that you don't